Today, Israeli President Isaac Herzog met with President Biden at the White House. Herzog is set to address a joint meeting of Congress tomorrow, which some progressive lawmakers are planning to boycott due to the country's treatment of the Palestinian people. Israel continues to encroach on the West Bank by expanding settlements on Palestinian land. And earlier this month, the Israeli army raided the West Bank city of Jenin in its biggest military action in years, claiming it was a counterterrorism effort. The president of Israel isn't actually the head of government. That is Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who leads the most right-wing government in the country's history, which includes continuing to expand the settlements. He's also attempting to completely overhaul and take control of the country's judicial system, which Israelis have been protesting for months. Amid all of this, President Biden announced yesterday that he has invited Netanyahu to the White House. And joining me now is Peter Beinar, editor-at-large at Jewish Currents and MSNBC political analyst. It's always great to talk to you, Peter. Um, let's talk about this. This is a far-right-wing government. It includes a, a gentleman named Itamar Ben-Gavir, who's the minister, I guess, of securities in charge of the police. Um, and this is what uh, I will read about him from The New Yorker. Itamar Gavir's role model and ideological wellspring has long been Meyer Kahana. Kahana argued that the idea of a democratic Jewish state is nonsense. To Kahara, Arabs were dogs who must sit quietly or get the hell out. Um, and for those from New York, we remember Meyer, who Meyer Kahana is, but most people don't. What does it mean to have an advocate, a, a sort of acolyte of the late Meyer Kahana in the government and Netanyahu's current stance. The fundamental reality is that in the West Bank, you have Jews and Palestinians living side by side, but under completely different legal systems. The Jews are citizens of the state of Israel. They can vote for its government. They have free movement. They have due process. The Palestinians have none of those rights. They live under military law. They need a military permission to travel, for instance, from the West Bank into Jerusalem. So what Itamar Ben-Gavir believes is that, that that's not harsh enough. Right? This is already what's been characterized by Israel's own human rights organizations as apartheid. But Itamar Ben-Gavir wants to go further. And I think if you look carefully at what he's written and what some other very far-right leaders in this Israeli government have written, their long-term goal is the expulsion of Palestinians from the West Bank. And, and I do want to put up a couple of maps, because the occupation is in and of itself illegal, right? I mean, the UN has been very clear there's supposed to be an Israel and a Palestine. But let me just show you the West Bank. The West Bank is supposed to be this little, this whole strip that you see there. All those red dots and parts of it are the settlements. You could actually make that bigger because there's also a whole line, a whole big, big area that comprises about 60 percent of the West Bank that is also used for security zones and uh, nature preservatories and all sorts of ways of saying Palestinians basically have almost nothing left. If you look at the map of Gaza, it's basically like a, a, an open air prison. Palestinians who typically would be fisher, fishermen, um, would, would fish in uh, the, the, you know, the water that you see there, they can't because if they go a certain amount, they get shot. It's, it's impossible for people to survive this way. How has the international community done nothing about this? Uh, it's been decades and decades of this. It's, it's worse than that. The United States funds this. The United States gives Israel $3.8 billion of essentially unconditional military aid a year. And the United States ensures at the UN, at the International Criminal Court, that there is total impunity, that there can never be investigations by the international bodies of what Israel's doing. And look, there are a lot of Americans who have a very, very deep connection to Israel and see, because of the suffering of Jews throughout history, a sense of solidarity and concern for those people. You don't need to tell me. Uh, you know, uh, I was raised my entire life with, with those feelings. I care desperately about the welfare of, the, of, of my own people. But it is not in the long-term interests of it will not keep Jews safe in the long term to brutalize and subjugate Palestinians, just like it didn't in the long, wasn't in the long term safety and self interest of white people to brutalize black people in the United States. Ultimately, when you oppress people and you inflict terrible violence on them, it comes back to you. The answer, I think, we're rapidly, Democrats are realizing that partition is no longer possible. And the core principle in Israel Palestine has to be the same one we're fighting for here, which is that people deserve equality under the law, irrespective of what religion or ethnicity they are. 
it also didn't work in South Africa, and you said apartheid. Um, this is what um, the, 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 the far right in, in uh, Israel and this Kahanist sort of movement really wants, a foundational desire to have as few non-Jews in the country as possible, greater powers to crack down on the judiciary, greater segregation between Jewish and non-Jewish populations, greater crackdowns on freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, and also religious rule, which sounds like what we're dealing with in this country as well. And you also mentioned Jim Crow. That sounds like it has shades of that. And I wonder, you know, people got very upset with Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal when she called Israel a racist state. She did take it back. But, but is apartheid, it, it, it doesn't feel defensible. Uh, and I wonder if you're starting to see a change in the way that Americans think about um, if, if this is, as you call it, apartheid, whether we think about it and whether media is trying to speak about it in a different way. Yes, there, there's a shift going, going on. Part of it is that Palestinians who were long absent from this conversation are now getting being having the ability to speak their own truths, and people are hearing them talk, and more people are going. And I can just tell you from personal experience, um, even when— Almost anybody who goes and sees what life is like for Palestinians without basic rights, no matter yeah. how much they sympathize with Israel, they're horrified by that. People yeah. in America are realizing the struggle we're fighting here for equality and against ethno-nationalism is the same struggle we need to support in Israel-Palestine. Yeah, absolutely. And people are throwing rocks and fighting back because they don't know what else to do. And I don't know how you can't empathize with people who have no rights and no freedom and are quickly losing their homes and their land. It is so tragic. Uh, Peter Beinart, thank you. I really appreciate always getting to talk with you. Thank you.